Hello and welcome tonight. Calls for a new constitution and repositioning the nation for development re-echoes in Adoikiti as legal luminary Are Afe Babalola marks 60th anniversary at the bar. Federal High Court Abuja orders Attorney General of the Federation and INEC to halt prosecution of suspended resident electoral commissioner for Adamoa State, Hudu Yunissa Ari. Federal government files eight count charge against former Minister of Aviation Stella Odua for falsely claiming to have lost her National Youth Service Corps NYSC certificate. And US President Joe Biden meets King Charles III and UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak with both sides reaffirming their commitment to the other. On business news tonight, Nigeria's capital importation rises by about 8.6.8% to $1.13 billion in the first quarter of this year, according to National Bureau of Statistics. From Abuja, the nation's capital, the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency to embark on vaccination campaign against the spread of diphtheria. Again, in Ekiti State, where the issue of how to tackle Nigeria's developmental challenges came to the fore once again. It was an occasion to mark the 60th anniversary of Are Afe Babalola at the bar, which also provided an opportunity for speakers at the event to revisit the need for a new constitution for the country. For the Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Bishop Matthew Kuka, who was the keynote speaker, there is urgent need for the country to democratize development development before talking about development of democracy itself. The event was attended by prominent Nigerians, including former President Ulusegun Obasanjo, former Secretary General of the Commonwealth, Chief Emeka Anyonku, among others. It's been a journey of 60 years for the legal luminary, a rare Feba Balola in the profession, and this hall is filled with big names in Nigeria and beyond who have come to grace the anniversary. The event also produces unending accolades as former president of Basenjo describes the senior lawyer as highly principled, committed and accomplished. I have come to know and learn a lot from Mare Afebabalala. It's a man you must never take for granted. If you do, you are on your own. That I will say to you. He's a serious-minded man. And if you don't know that, you don't know anything. If he's laughing with you, and it's humorous, a little bit. But when you hit him on the wrong side, you will see the other side of his eyes. And more tributes pouring from the Ekiti State Governor, Mr. Biodun Oyebanji, and a representative from King's College, London, the Professor Fumi Oloni Shaki. On behalf of everyone at the University of London, it gives me great pleasure to congratulate Are Afe Babalola on the 60th anniversary of being called to bar. Are, your journey is remarkable and an inspirational example of everything we strive to do as a university. Daddy, I congratulate you. Thank you so much for what you are to humanity. Thank you so much for providing platform for those that are hopeless to have hope. Thank you, Daddy, because I can stand here today as a governor of the United States because of people like you. But it's not only a day for praises, as the keynote speaker also addresses the issue of constitutional reforms in Nigeria Coming to participate in the making of the constitution is always at the discretion of the person who is the president. And he uses other sources of information. But I found that the struggle to represent traditional rulers, to represent the church, to represent all kinds of aggregate groups, ends up with a lot of people with very little understanding of what constitution making is. And what, I, what became very clear to me that 
most of the people who showed up saw the place as a theater for political and political transaction. The biggest applause of today in celebration. The diamond celebrants, Are Afe Babalola, mounts the podium, highlighting his call for a new and truly federal constitution if Nigeria will be rightly run. Nigeria is not one country. It's a country of more than 300 nations and tribes. You need a new constitution which will allow each part to develop at its own rate. And at the same time, a nation will now evolve from that constitution. Are Babalola has trained over a thousand lawyers and has produced at least 25 senior advocates of Nigeria, reputed as the largest by any law firm in the country. No wonder there's the launch of a book in its honor titled Unveiling the Diamond at the Bar. Another highlight of the event is a panel discussion which is chaired by former president of Basenjo. Democracy, it is a journey, it's not a destination. I'm saying that the ugly past is not behind us at all. Because today, the level of corruption in Nigeria has assumed a very dangerous dimension. Highly placed public officers, Still money men for building hospitals and people are dying on our roads. And for the new government, the president must show leadership. Are Afe Babalola has been conferred with over 50 titles and awards across the globe, including honorary doctor of laws and doctor of letters from 10 universities, including the University of London, University of Lagos, and University of Ibado. 58. The event ended with the cutting 59. of the diamond anniversary cake. 60. For he's a jolly good fellow. Congratulations to the legal icon. And the president has returned to the country after a two-day trip to Guinea-Bissau where he attended the 63rd ordinary session of the Authority of Heads of State and Government of the Economic Community of West African States, ECOWAS, in Bissau. At the summit, which is the president's first meeting with the ECOWAS Authority, President Bola Tinubu emerged as the new chairman of ECOWAS. The president warned that the threat to peace in the sub-region had reached an alarming proportion with terrorism and an emergent pattern of military takeover of government and that now it demands urgent and concerted actions from member states. We will not allow coup after coup to this African prisoner. It's a challenge. Yes, democracy is very tough to manage, but it's the best form of government. And we also ascribe to it. We, we work collectively to pursue inclusive economic integration of West Africa, the region. We should serve a warning to exploiters that our people have suffered enough. We should make a pledge here that in furtherance of our region's economic recovery and growth, we will commit to democracy and promote democracy and rule of law. I am with you. In Nigeria, we are back. 
Nigeria's President Bola Tinubu. Meanwhile, ahead of the National Executive Committee meeting of the All Progressives Congress, the National Chairman of the Party, Senator Abdullah Adamu, is urging party leaders at the state level to be united. Senator Adamu explained that the postponement of the party's next meeting earlier scheduled to hold today and tomorrow was due to the absence of the president. He was speaking in Abuja at a meeting with the chairman of the party from the 36 states and the federal capital territory. A meeting is summoned by the National Working Committee and it's essentially to give us opportunity of sitting with the gentleman. Unfortunately, there's no woman amongst you. To be able to sit with you to discuss developments taking place or developments that will take place by the grace of God in our great party. I must let us all know, those who know, who remember, who had a very, very fruitful meeting with the state governors. The essence of the meeting was to brief them on the fact that we are going to have our first national executive committee since the election of 2023. And it will be the first our president, commander-in-chief, Mr. Senator Ahlebola Astinabu, will be attending with his vice president, Kashim Shetima, for the first time. Staying with politics, a former governor of Ogun State and now senator in the 10th Assembly, Otumbag Benga Daniel, has been speaking more on the letter he wrote forfeiting his salary as an ex-governor. Senator Daniel, who spoke today in Lagos, says he is guided by his conscience over the decision. He also touched on the issue of the need for a true federal structure for the country to move forward. I think restructuring should be looked at from the point of view of various components. <clears throat> And if you look at what is currently happening, even before the advent of Tinubu administration, some form of tinkering have started. One of the biggest problems facing us as a country is security. And part of the components of restructuring is how to decentralize the policing system. And I think part of what restructuring should be all about is that derivation areas should get more and if they do get more, harder to, everybody thought that everything is going to Niger Delta. But okay, now, if the Afrika people get something from gold, the Bauchi bauxite, the just people from tin, my people from gold, and so on and so forth, everybody will feel that, yes, we're having a, a, a fair share. Between you and I, all this talk about restructuring is also about economy development. When you get into public office, you have to tidy a lot of things up. Because there are so many things that goes into it. Oh, you must not operate foreign accounts. You must not. So I just said, okay, what are the things that I need to tidy up now that I'm here again? And this issue of double payment uh, came. I said, okay, look, let us just uh, remind the governor that from this date, I have now been signed it. And I hope that from that date, I'll be receiving my emoluments as a senator of the Federal Republic. So kindly step down. Uh, the one that you are doing uh, for me. Probably after seeing it, I will decide, depending on what the law says, whether there will be uh, severance, I mean, uh, pension for senators or pension for governor, and then probably say, okay, which one do I want to, or which one does it not permit you? So it's all so simple. But I was really in shock to see that it has generated so much uh, uh, interest. In part two, after the break, Lagos State Task Force on Environment and Special Offenses Unit begins operation to clear traders along the Ketayaba rail line. We have that story and more in a moment. Please stay with us. 
Welcome back. If you just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, coming to you live from Channel's television. Here's a reminder of our top stories. Call for a new constitution and repositioning the nation for development reoccurs in Adoikiti as legal luminary Are Afe Babalola marks 60th anniversary at the bar. Federal High Court Abuja orders Attorney General of the Federation and INEC to hold prosecution of suspended resident electoral commissioner for Damora State, Udu Yunisa Airi. Federal government files eight count charge against former Minister of Aviation Stella Odua for falsely claiming to have lost a National Youth Service Corps NYSC certificate. Plus, US President Joe Biden meets King Charles III and UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak with both sides reaffirming their commitment to the other. To legal matters now, Justice Donatus Okorowo of the Federal High Court Abuja has ordered the Attorney General of the Federation and the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, to halt the prosecution of the suspended Adamawa resident electoral commissioner, Hudu Yunisa Ari. Mr. Yunisa Ari is facing trial for electoral offences, including illegally declaring Senator Aisha to Dahiru Binani as winner of the Adamawa governorship election. Justice Okorowo gave the order following an ex party application brought by the council to Aisha Benani, Mike and Durka. The court held that since the matter is before tribunal and the parties have submitted to the law, the party should maintain status quo on the matter pending the conclusion of the suit. At the day's proceedings, counsel to Ms. Benani brought two applications, a motion seeking to interpret Section 144 of the Electoral Act 2022 and an order seeking to maintain status quo in the matter pending the determination of the suit. In another legal matter, the federal government has filed an eight-count charge against former Minister of Aviation Stella Odua at a federal high court in Abuja. The government is accusing her of falsely claiming to have lost her National Youth Service Corps NYSC certificate, thereby committing an offence contrary to Section 3, Subsection 6 of the Miscellaneous Offences Act and punishable under Section 3, Subsection 1 of the same Act. The former minister is also accused of forwarding her credentials to the federal government, among which is an affidavit and extract from police crime diary that she lost her NYC certificate. According to the government, this representation, which she knew was false, led to her nomination as cabinet minister. Senator Odua is also accused of forwarding same NYC certificate to INEC in 2015, which led to her election as a senator representing Anambra North Senatorial District. The senatorial aspirant in Anambra, Mr. John Emeka, had last year sued Ms. Odua at the Federal High Court Abuja, seeking an order invalidating her nomination on the same basis. However, the court dismissed the suit for being status barred. Or still staying with legal matters, the Deputy Governor of Lagos, Obafemi Hamzat, has tendered some documents before the State Election Petition Tribunal in a bid to prove that he thoroughly filled out the Independent National Electoral Commission, the INEC Form EC9, which contains his full personal information as the party's candidate as well as the oath that was taken on the nomination form. The documents were tendered by a council representing the governor and his deputy, senior advocate of Nigeria, Moise Banire, through his witness, a chieftain of the All Progressives Congress, Honorable Fouad Oki. Other documents tendered and admitted through the same witness were the international Nigerian and American passports for the deputy governor. The candidate of the Labour Party, Badibo Rhodes-Viva, is challenging the victory of Governor Babajide Songulu in the March 18th governorship poll. He is also challenging the eligibility of Mr Hamzat to contest on the ground that he allegedly swore allegiance to the United States of America. Justice Arum Ashram has adjourned further hearing in the petition till tomorrow, July the 11th, 2023, for the All Progressives Congress to open its defence. Away from legal matters, as part of efforts to tackle environmental menace in Lagos, the state's task force on environmental and special defences unit today cleared out traders along the Kejayaba railway line. The task force commander explained that the traders have been warned about their activities on the line. He also noted that the task force is carrying out similar operation in other areas. 
Months after the Lagos State Task Force on Environmental and Special Offenses Unit served notices on traders along the Oshodi Yaba rail line, they seemed ready to put their words into action. Very early, the passenger train rides through the Bolade Ushudi axis as traders display their wares along the rail line. Minutes later, the task force operatives who had been monitoring the activity swooped on the traders. They could not salvage their wares from the enforcement team. Enforcement activities will be on daily basis and we are not going to relent because it is for the good of everybody. You know, the, the, the day danger wants to come, it will not signal anybody. And it, it is always a big calamity for us to manage. That is why we are trying, you know, to, to do this cleaning up so that for adventure something untoward wants to happen, at least we would have been able, you know, to put it under a very minimal uh, control. The look of disbelief is vivid on their faces as they plead with the team. We don't have rights to be here. We know we don't have rights. All we are saying that, please, we are pleading. Let this be the first and the last for us. Please. This, we know anything they did to us, they have the right. They have all the right. We are guilty of everything. We know we are very guilty. But all I can say is that we are pleading. From a distance, they look at how their goods are being rolled into the truck. For the chairman of the task force, the action of the enforcement team is a punitive measure. We still need to strike balance. By the time sellers have been arrested, we have been carted away, you understand, or been taken away. It becomes double jeopardy. So we need to create some kind of balance. They will still come to our office. Even if the matter gets to court eventually, we will still try you know, to create some kind of leverage. We are by at the end of the day, maybe what they might have suffered is just not to have their goods for some period of days. But we are going to call their, their leaders again and talk to them. As the goods are loaded and moved to base, the traders appear hopeless, but may have to explore other areas to carry on with their trade, as according to them, they depend on this business to take care of their households. Well, Victor Mathias has more from our Abuja studios. Hi, Victor. Good to see you're keeping well on that side. It's been a minute, uh, Millicent. It's good to see you as well. And welcome to the nation's capital, Abuja. And we begin with health matters, where the Director General of the National Center for Disease Control Dr. Ifedayo Adetifa is calling for vaccination against the spread of diphtheria across the country. Dr. Adetifa told the news conference in Abuja that more than 70% of the cases of the disease recently recorded are within the age brackets of two and eight years, owing to the unvaccinated status of 82% of children. He said that the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency is embarking on a vaccination campaign. If you are vaccinated according to our immunization schedule and you receive your three doses of the pentavalent vaccine, which contains anti diphtheria toxin at 6, 10, and 14 weeks, then you are protected against mm -hmm. diphtheria. Okay, so this is why I say we are unfortunately seeing the consequences of historical poor vaccination coverage. As you know, there have been more recent efforts to make sure that vaccination coverage improves. And I think we are seeing a bit of the evidence because infants or children under two who have higher coverage these days are less affected by the ongoing outbreak. We are saying two to 14 year olds, but there are even older people, above 40 adults that are um, affected, which is why poor vaccination coverage is the whole story about the current diphtheria outbreak. Now, it doesn't mean that because people then we are not vaccinated when they were younger, that they are now being ignored now. As you may already be aware, I think starting from Friday in Abuja, MPHCDA is conducted a vaccination campaign, okay? Other vaccines, but including 
a diphtheria antitoxin containing vaccine in the communities at least the hotspots where these cases um, or this case was found um, and I know that they have plans to continue to um, campaigns uh, as well which is targeted at the older age groups For now still ahead on the news at 10 Nigeria's capital importation rises by about 6.8 percent to 1.13 billion dollars in the first quarter of 2023 now that's according to the National Bureau of Statistics and that's in business news who join us again Many thanks for staying with us. Now, the federal government is asking the organized private sector to prioritize the non oil sector of the economy in order to grow Nigeria's foreign exchange inflows. Now, this position was conversed by the executive director of the Nigeria Export Promotion Council, Mr. Ezra Yakusak, at a conference in Abuja on trade and non oil export organized by the Nigeria Employers Consultative Association, NECA. Conversations around the development of Nigeria's non-oil sector have continued to lead discussions at fora where the economy of the country is the subject. This is also the crux of the discussions at the summit, as members of the Nigeria Employers Consultative Association meet to brainstorm on the topic, trade and non-oil economy, changing the narrative for rapid national development. The consensus here is that the federal government needs to deliberately plan to unlock the economic potentials of the country's non-oil sector. Today, our focus and our attention is on the imperative of increasing trade and non-oil exports. We have a new government in place. It's apt. Some wonder why we're holding this event when we yet do not have um, the full cabinet as it were in place. But we're also conscious of the fact that soon after they get into office, we do not want them to start opening old books, but we want them to start with new things and get challenged with new demands. The keynote speaker, Dr. Kimumi Adishino, is represented by the country director general of the African Development Bank, Mr. Lamin Baru. He underscores the importance of mobilizing the private sector to build regional infrastructure and promote regional trade to boost exports. Promoting trade and regional integration offers another great opportunity to diversify the Nigerian, further diversify the Nigerian economy. So to remove the barriers to non-oil trade and exports, Nigeria must decisively fix its power sector once and for all. However, the executive director of the Nigeria Exports Promotion Council is tasking the private sector to focus on non-oil exports. I want to appeal to the private sector. I want to appeal to you. In as much as we advise, in as much as we are trying to create an enabling environment for you to export, please stop exporting jobs. You export jobs or you export raw commodities. If we are serious about this, the private sector, I'm asking you now, please, you need to add value on, your, on our products. Developing the country's non-oil sector has been a major thrust of the economic blueprints of successive governments. And although Nigeria's non-oil exports have had some growth in recent years, experts are looking to see that the growth translates to more foreign exchange inflow for the country. Now, the Tertiary Education Trust Fund, TET Fund, says it is embracing digital technology in Nigerian universities to produce graduates that are employable in line with requisite certifications. According to the Director General of TET Fund, Mr. Sonia Chono, the agency intends to embark on capacity building for students and teachers. He stated this at a meeting in Abuja, where he emphasized the fund's plans to adopt digital learning in schools. Uh, we are through an approval granted to the Ministry of uh, Communications and Digital Economy that we are now forced to key in. Minimum academic standards now require that every graduate will be ICT compliant. And there is some certification that is now required before you can get jobs in this country now. And these policies have been adopted awaiting implementation. 
So if we don't take the initiative of doing it now, it's going to be forced on us, invariably. Otherwise, we are going to be producing graduates who now are not collecting your certificates. Have to go and do another training to get the requisite certification to be able to get employment. Now, for our this year's implementation plan, the following compressed services have been approved. The first is the communication and essential ICT skills capacity development, which is the reason why we are here. And given the success of the previously implemented ICTL productivity skills capacity building, the need for further capacity building in communication and ICT skills enhancement was identified. This capacity building will target both staff and students and to improve their productivity and equip them with the essential skills necessary for our increasing digital economy. The second is the anthology on the Blackboard online e-learning enhancements. These are become necessary to standardize the online learning management landscape. And inherent benefits of this include the creation of a nationwide center of excellence in digital learning to enable and certify thousands of teachers. We also want to provide access to a worldwide community of over 4,000 institutions and best practices amongst other educational benefits. In Anambra State, Governor Chikuma Saludo has directed an immediate psychological counseling and therapy session for Ms. Imesoma Ejikeme after she admitted manipulating her GEM results to produce a fake copy. The outcome of government's probe had laid to rest the controversy of the highest scorer in the 2023 Unified Tertiary Matriculation Examination. The committee confirmed that Ms. Ejikeme manipulated her UTME result, giving herself a score of 362 as against her actual score of 249. In a letter to the principal of Anglican Girls Secondary School in Newey, Governor Saludo directed that the young girl be handed over to a professor of clinical psychology. The directive is part of the recommendations of the committee set up by the state government to investigate the matter. And that's it from the nation's capital. It's back to Millicent in Lagos with the rest of the news at 10. Millicent, back to you. Thanks, Victor. The journey toward the implementation of the Nigeria Customs Service Act of 2023 may have commenced and one of the major highlights of the act is that there will be stiffer penalties for defaulters. It also seeks to position the Nigerian Customs Service to be financially stable to recruit the required number of officers needed to man the nation's porous border stations. According to the Acting Controller General of the Nigeria Customs Service, Adewale Adeni, the service has resolved that the nation's borders will be manned effectively to boost revenue. Up next is Business News with Anne Waldo. Thank you, Millicent. Hello and welcome to Business News. Total capital importation into the country recorded the growth in the first three months of this year. Latest data coming from the National Bureau of Statistics shows the total capital imported grew by 6.878% to $1.13 billion in the first quarter of this year. And that's coming up $1.06 billion that was recorded in the last quarter of last year. Meanwhile, on a year-to-year -year basis, it dropped by 28% from $1.57 billion posted in the first quarter of 2022. The portfolio investments accounted for 57.32% of total capital imported in the first quarter, and that's the highest during the period, with foreign direct investment at 4.2%. The United Kingdom ranked as top country with highest capital inflow into Nigeria, followed by United Arab Emirates, and the United States. The Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise has commended the executive orders recently issued by President Bola Tinubu, describing it as boosting Nigeria's manufacturing sector. A statement from the economic think tank CEO Muda Yusuf says the move has brought instant relief to manufacturers in Nigeria as the sector's growth has slowed to 1.6% in the first quarter of this year, coming from 2.8% it was in the fourth quarter 
of last year, having now contracted by 1.9% in the third quarter of last year due to unfavorable policies by the government. Dr. Muda Yusuf also commended the suspension of green tax on some categories of vehicles, as well as the deterrent of deferment of the effective date of the Finance Act 2023 and customs tariffs as a positive development. Meanwhile, the Federal Inland Revenue Service, the FIRS, has extended the deadline for the submission of company income tax, which is the CIT returns for this year as assessment. In a statement, the FIRS says the filing of returns, which was initially fixed for June the 30th, has now been extended to August the 31st this year. According to the FIRS Executive Chairman, Mohamed Nami, the extension of filing date does not include returns for withholding tax, value-added tax, as well as personal income tax. He encourages taxpayers to take the opportunity to submit their CIT returns within the specified time to avoid a penalty. Let's head to the domestic market now, where it resumed the second trading week in the month of July with bullish sentiments. The all share index crossed into 64,000 level. Any John Mekwa has the details. Thank you so much and welcome to the Stock Market Report. Well, I have great news for you. Nigeria's equity market grew more than 4,000%, not 400, 4,000 percent in the first quarter of 2023, and that's compared to Q4 of 2022, it tops portfolio investment for the period. <laughs> no wonder the bull is really happy about that. I'm talking about astronomical height. No wonder the all share index gained 2.48 percent, building on the 43,000 points it gained on Friday. Now it has hit 64,603.69, and the market cap. Looking good at 35 trillion naira plus. That's what we have here now. 71 gainers, 19 losers. See the height, see the difference. And leading the sentiment today, market mover Dangote Cement gain 30 naira. 30 naira to close at 330 naira. 10 come on, that's the max it can gain at 10. So, is it uh, too late for Anne to get into the market? I do not know, but Anne, it's up to you to decide. I'm Imi John Mekwa. Back to you. And that's business news for tonight. Thank you for watching. I'm Anne Mwawodo. The rest of the news at 10 continues now with Millicent. Thank you, Anne. Coming up next on the News at 10, U.S. President Joe Biden meets King Charles III and U.K. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak with both sides reaffirming their commitment to the other. You stay with us. And U.S. President Joe Biden is on a one-day visit to the U.K. and just a while ago met with King Charles III. It will be the president's first meeting with King Charles since the coronation in May, a move set to be in line with the long-standing practice of U.S. presidents. They were set to have discussed a number of issues surrounding climate change with top financiers and philanthropists. Here's Simon Pusey with other international stories and around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the channel's studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. The US president has met King Charles and the UK prime minister with both sides reaffirming their commitment to the other. Arriving in his car known as the Beast at 10 Downing Street, Joe Biden smiled as he shook hands with Rishi Sunak on the red carpet. Speaking later in the garden, the U.S. president said the U.S.-U.K. relationship was as strong as ever. Our, our relationship is rock solid. Meanwhile, Mr. Sunak said the two had a lot to talk yeah, about. Welcome. It's great to have you here, back in Downing Street. I think you've been here a few times before, I know, but your first time as president. So we're very privileged and fortunate to have you here. Thanks for coming. Great for us to carry on our conversations. <laughs> Mr. Biden then made the trip to Windsor Castle by helicopter, where he met King Charles. Are we content? They discussed climate change, a cause the monarch has long embraced. Thank you. It is Mr. Biden's first meeting with the king since he was officially crowned in May.
The Kremlin says Russian President Vladimir Putin met with the mercenary leader Yevgeny Prigozhin after the failed Wagner Group mutiny last month. Dmitry Peskov said Prigozhin, who heads the group, was among 35 people invited to the meeting in the Kremlin in Moscow. He said that President Putin had given an assessment of the Ukraine war effort and the mutiny. The rebellion, launched on the 23rd of June, lasted just 24 hours. Er is de afgelopen dagen gespeculeerd over wat mij zou motiveren. The Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte has unexpectedly said he will leave politics after the upcoming election, marking the end of his run as the longest-serving government leader in Dutch history. Rutte made his announcement three days after he abruptly handed in the resignation of his fourth coalition administration, which had failed to agree on stricter immigration policies. The 56-year-old became premier in 2010 and is the longest-serving government leader in the European Union after Hungary's Viktor Orban. He will stay on as leader of a caretaker government until a new administration is formed. India's northern hill state of Himachal Pradesh has been reeling under torrential rains that triggered landslides and stranded commuters and tourists. At least 22 people have died in floods and landslides. Flash floods in Himachal Pradesh over the weekend brought down a bridge and swept away houses as authorities used helicopters to rescue people stranded on roads and bridges. New Delhi, Punjab and Himachal Pradesh have received up to 112% more rainfall than average in the current monsoon season that started on June the 1st. The World Meteorological Organization says Antarctic sea ice levels have reached record lows, a worrying development that experts say coincided with exceptionally high global sea surface temperatures. The WMO said that Antarctic sea ice levels last month, the hottest June ever recorded, were at their lowest since satellite observations began at 17% below average. There's a lot of con concerns from the, from the scientific community and uh, a lot of uh, catch-up in the scientific community trying to understand these um, incredible changes we're seeing at the moment. And it's very concerning. And residents of South Africa's biggest city, Johannesburg, have been stunned by the first snowfall in more than a decade. With some children seeing snow for the very first time. While some parts of South Africa regularly experience snowy winters, Johannesburg last saw snow in August 2012. The South African Weather Service has issued warnings because of the cold that has struck Gauteng province that contains Johannesburg and the capital Pretoria. Maybe uh, do things we, we used to see in cartoons, making snow angels and whatnot. <laughs> ah, you, as, as you can see, the snow is something that doesn't happen like each and every time. It's, it's just amazing. The weather looks beautiful, you know. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the channel's studios in Lagos. It's time for sports. Host country Angola beating Nigeria Tigers 57-48 at the FIBA Africa and to advance to the quarterfinals. Despite our scoring Angola 15-80, in the quarterfinal, Nigeria paid the price for a lie easy basket early in the game. And with this evening's defeat, Nigeria finished second in Group B and still has a chance to qualify for the quarterfinals on Wednesday when they face Gabon. And that's it on Sports Millicent. It's back to you. Thanks, Jeffrey. And the main news again. A call for a new constitution and repositioning the nation for development re echo today in Adoikiti as legal luminary Are Afe Babalola marked his 60th anniversary at the bar. The keynote speaker at the event, Catholic Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Bishop Matthew Kuka, said there is the urgent need for the country to democratize development before talking about development of democracy itself. U.S. President Joe Biden today met King Charles III and U.K. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak with both sides reaffirming their commitment to the other. And that's your news at 10 tonight. Many thanks for watching. I'm in the Central Walker. Have a good night.